so, so Peter said I, need, I could only talk for half an hour. And, and so I'll talk for half an hour and I hope I'll make some people mad and, and you'll ask some questions. And so you have to have the title. Oh, that's the title. And that's me. So I want to talk about two, two different things. Uh, the implications of one size doesn't fit all. Uh, basically, the traditional relational database vendors have been marketing one size fits all for 30 years. And, uh, and if you ask your Oracle salesman, uh, he comes by and he says uh, 12C, 9I, 11J is the answer. Now, what was your problem? <laughs> and so, uh, in my opinion, that is no longer true and hasn't been true for a while. So I'll talk about some implications of that. Do you, do you have a question? Okay. And, and then I'm going to talk about uh, the things that kind of get me all riled up. And I want to talk about Hadoop uh, and tell you why I think uh, they're doing a huge uh, bait and switch on you. Uh, I want to talk about screen processing. Uh, I want to talk about Son of Flash. And then I want to talk about the elephant war that's about to be rubbed. So anyway, so if you run Oracle uh, or DP2 or SQL Server or MySQL or Postgres or Ingress or dot dot dot, uh, what, you, what you were running underneath the hood it, unless you squint a lot, uh, they all are storing fields of, in a single record contiguously on disk, disk. So the next thing in storage is the next attribute in the same record. Uh, they use B3 indexing as the omnipresent gold standard. Uh, most everybody has fairly small disk blocks that are really heavily encoded. So uh, in the case, you know, there's a header on the front of every record, which is big. Uh, it has a bitmap for the uh, null fields and non-null fields. You put all the fixed length records first, you put all the variable length records after that. <clears throat> and so if you actually want to process a record, you've got to decode it in a substantial way. Uh, a lot of people uh, align fields on, on binary word boundaries. And the technology for query optimizers and executors dates from 1979 when Pat Selinger wrote her pioneering paper. Uh, more importantly, everybody uh, does crash recovery by drinking the C. Mohan Kool-Aid. Uh, he wrote a paper in Todd's uh, in the mid-90s on a system called Aries. Uh, which says that you know if you want to recover, you, you write it. You have a log that uh, writes the before image and after image to disk uh, before you commit the record. You do group commit. Uh, the paper is very dense, uh, and it's essentially what everybody implements. And everybody implements row level, uh, record level, dynamic block. Uh, Unless you squint, all of these systems look roughly the same, and I'll just call them a row. This is row store technology, and the vendors who are selling you row, row store technology are selling you systems that are typically at least a quarter of a century old. <clears throat> so I wrote a paper in 2006 saying that uh, this adage of one size fits all is no longer true. Uh, that you know that other other database systems are are appropriate for various kinds of problems. Uh, eight years later, I make a much stronger statement. I'd say that the the elephant uh, technology is good for absolutely nothing, and so one size fits none. And so if if you're running one of these legacy systems. By and large, uh, you're way off the technology curve. Okay, so why do I say that and what are the implications? Well, in round numbers, the database market is, is thirdsies. Uh, a third of it is analytics. Uh, a third of it is uh, transaction processing. 
and a third of it is everything else. Now, Peter made me put in this slide. So this is marketing's, marketing's organization of database applications. So uh, data lake has become a popular term. Uh, the Hadoop vendors all use it. Uh, I think HDFS, by the way, I think is a technical disaster. And so I, I hope it gets replaced by something else. And so you can do uh, the things that run on HDFS these days are uh, various Hadoop things, various data warehouse things, uh, various analytics, and so forth. Uh, in general, your data lake is loaded from some from the Internet of Things or some upstream transaction processing system. By and large, your long-term data warehouse schema is different than your real-time schema. So there's an ETL process in between the big stuff and your real-time systems. And in, in real-time systems, they're either transaction processing or they're conditioning uh, data from sensors. And so there's high velocity uh, stuff going on. Lots of times, you never want to lose data. And so the green stuff often is transactional. Sometimes you don't care and you simply, you simply run. If you crash, you start again. But I'm going to be mostly talking about green stuff where you want it to be transactional. So that's the marketing slide. And it proves that marketing can grow pretty pictures. OK. So in the blue stuff, it's simply true that a column store is 100 times faster than a row store on the kinds of business intelligence queries that you guys run. And why, why is that so? I mean, there, there's dozens of benchmarks. All the, all the row store vendors will admit that this slide is true. And why is it true? Well, in a typical blue stuff application, you've got a fact table in the middle of some dimensions, and the fact table has a lot of columns. There's a lot of data in fact tables. Let's just say 100 is, is a reasonably modest number, and your typical analytics query reads five columns out of those 100, and the other 95 it doesn't touch. Now, if you're running a row store, you pull in a disk block, and the disk block has all 100 records, all 100 columns in it. So you read them even though you only want five. If you're running a column store like Vertica, you read exactly those five columns. The 95 you don't need never come off the disk. Doesn't it depend on your query pattern? Absolutely, absolutely. This is, but if I have 20 terabytes of data, I never run select star. <laughs> and, and, and so over in the, in the data warehouse market, the query pattern is I'm interested, I'm interested, I mean, let's just take the case of Walmart. So Walmart has, a, uh, has an item level historical database of everything that went under any wand anywhere in the Walmart system and they keep it for something like three years. So I'm the, I'm the person who's provisioning Walmart stores for hurricanes. So there were four hurricanes in Florida in the 2007 hurricane season. So I want to know what sold in the week before the hurricane, what sold in the week after the hurricane, and compare that with same store sales in Georgia. That's five attributes out of 100. And that's just the typical pattern that you see over and over and over again. And so all, I and mean, that was completely what motivated me when, when I designed Vertica. Because I said, oh my god, people are only reading a small collection of columns out of this back table. And you can take advantage of that. So a, a column store will be 20 times less data off the disk. The other thing that's really significant is that Everybody is compressing the heck out of this blue data lake. 
So if you have a column store on Vertica, there's exactly one kind of object in every 64K block. And in a row store, there are 100 kinds of objects. So which is easier, compressing 100 different kinds of things or compressing one kind of thing? So column stores just compress better by a factor of two or three or four. And so before you have to squint at all on winning by two orders of magnitude. Uh, it's also true that my, my query executor is a lot more efficient than a row store query executor. And the reason for that is that the inner loop in a row store query executor is pick up a row and do something, and then pick up the next row and do something. So the overhead of just doing stuff is basically proportional to the number of records I look at. In a column store, the basic operation is pick up a column. And that's much bigger than a row. And so the overhead I pay in sort of just doing all the bookkeeping, I pay a lot less often. So as near as I can tell, anybody who's going to survive in the uh, data warehouse business is going to get to uh, rewrite their system to be a column store. So there are native column store vendors. Uh, Vertica is one of them, designed from scratch as a column store. Uh, Redshift is the uh, uh, Amazon labeling of a product called Paracel, which is a uh, column store, native column store. Uh, HANA is a native column store. These systems written from scratch as column stores. There are people who are selling you native row stores, DB2, Teradata, Teza, Microsoft, Parallel Data Warehouse. Those are row store products, and they are all going to die because they're a factor of 100 slower than, than column store products. And then there are some smart people who used to have row stores and realized they're on the wrong side of the technology. And so they are in transition, converting from row stores to column stores. And Green Plum is an example of one such vendor. In my opinion, only column stores are going to survive. Because the minute you care about performance, you know, then I either run 100 times faster than the other guy, or I run on 10 nodes and he runs on 1,000. And so which one do you want to? And they're just, be, they're just behind such a technology curve that they, they, they will either rewrite everything or uh, they won't survive. So I made you mad already. Actually, actually, that that turns out to be historically true, but isn't true anymore. Their, F, their FPGAs run out of the buffer pool, and so that used to be true, but isn't true any longer. And this gets to be a deep dive into the Tisa. But uh, to the best of my knowledge, the, the little birdies are telling me that the Tisa is in the process of rewriting their whole system, as is Teradata. Because I think th this slide is simply true. Now, uh, I'm also a huge disbeliever in hardware database machines. And so both Matiza and Teradata are jacking up the price of, of a low-end PC and selling it to you at, at a two orders of magnitude markup. And it doesn't, their hardware doesn't go two orders of magnitude faster. So I think uh, both companies would be way better off giving up their iron and just running their software on jelly bean commodity stuff. Okay. Yes, please. Talking about cloud stores, uh, have uh, DSM based implementations that are uh, following along with the PAX, PAX model that have followed along with the uh, human uh, I just wanted your take on DSM versus a PAX model for a cloud stores. Uh, if you had any conclusion of what's, what's better or what uh, that, that, That's. Why, why, if I'm only going to talk for half an hour, I think let, let's let's talk offline. 
Okay, so uh, let's move to OLTP. And again, the, the elephants are uncompetitive in this market by a factor of 100. And the technology is not column stores, it's main memory. And the thing you're leveraging here is that OLTP databases are generally just not that big. Not that big meaning, I know Facebook is measured in petabytes, but they're an outlier. Most everybody's OLTP databases are, are very small numbers of terabytes or less. And if you want to buy a, a terabyte of main memory, you know, you don't have to whip out that big a checkbook to do it. So, so basically, new SQL systems like Volt leverage the heck out of main memory. And main memory database systems, just intuitively, are going to be wildly faster than disk-based database systems. But it gets a little more complicated because they certainly avoid converting back and forth between disk, repre disk block representation and processing representation. But in addition, row-level locking is incredibly expensive. None of the new SQL vendors use it. It's just too expensive. And VoltDB doesn't use uh, Aries-style write-ahead logging. It's too expensive. And a huge, huge issue is avoiding latch weights because you've got a lot of cores and multi-threaded systems end up lining up on latches. And so newly built systems look at where you're spending overhead and figure out how to minimize it. So VoltDB is about 100 times faster than Oracle or DB2 or dot, dot, dot on typical OLTP problems. And the new SQL vendors will simply prevail because this number is big enough that you will all, uh, you will all have performance problems at some point and the factor of 100 will be absolutely compelling. So other than the low end, and, and if you want to run 30 transactions a second, by all means run them on your iPhone or your wristwatch or whatever. But if you, if you have a performance, performance problem, uh, new SQL is gonna, is gonna be able to keep up with you and the legacy guys won't. So, in both OLTP and in OLAP, the legacy guys are on the wrong side of technology and have to rewrite everything. and have to rewrite it in two different ways. And so uh, I'm delighted I don't work for Oracle because you know they, they're facing, I mean they have, they have legacy code and to compete in the various markets, uh, they're going to have to rewrite their stuff in different ways. Now, a fair number of vendors are peddling that why don't you run one system to do both OLTP and OLAP? And these are sort of called hybrid systems. And this is a terrible idea. Uh, if, if, if you're running Oracle, then on OLAP you're 100x slower than, than Vertica. If you're running OLTP on Oracle, you're 100x slower than Volt. If you put the best of best of breed systems together, uh, then you run 100x faster. And in any case, most of the time you need an ETL system to convert between the two representations, and so you can't really run stuff, you know, on on the same the same schema representation anyway. So vendors that pedal hybrid hybrid. Uh, solutions run the other way. So in summary, the elephants are running 30-year-old code lines, which are not good at anything anymore. There's, there's no sweet spot for their systems at all. They deserve to be sent to the home for tired software. And they are, there's, there's a fantastic book called The Innovator's Dilemma by a Harvard Business School professor named Clayton Christensen that says if you're selling the legacy technology and the new stuff comes along, it's very, very difficult to morph from the old stuff to the new stuff without losing your customer base. And I recommend all of you read that book. It's very easy to read and, and 
and very, very true in every single legacy system software company is up against the innovator's dilemma in spades. And many of them are up against the innovator's dilemma in several different ways. Like versus OLTP, you've got to do one thing. Versus uh, data warehouses, you've got to do something else. Now the thing that I think you should take away from this is in the future, you are going to be running several different kinds of database systems. One size doesn't fit all. In fact, it fits none. And so you will be running somewhere between, you know, let's just say round numbers, five or six or seven different database systems. And there are very, very good technical reasons for doing that, as near as I can tell, for the foreseeable future. So you, you are going to have a data integration problem in spades. And, and I don't see any way around that. And so just get used to it and figure out how you're going to cope with multiple database systems, with multiple different architectures, multiple different transaction models. And, uh, and the, you, know, you will just get data integration and that that's going to be coming with one size fits none. Okay, I want to talk about some other things that get me really riled up. And the first one is Hadoop. So what exactly is Hadoop, just so we get really clear? So today's definition is it's a three-tier stack. At the bottom, there's a file system, which is HDFS. And HDFS is just like any other file system that you guys are running. On top of HDFS, uh, there is MapReduce. And MapReduce was written by Google on top of the Google file system. HDFS is Yahoo's open source copy of, of the Google file system. And Hadoop originally meant uh, Yahoo's open source uh, re-implementation of MapReduce, uh, and that was what originally was called Hadoop, but Hadoop now has a different meaning. So I'll call it MapReduce. And on top of that of MapReduce, uh, there's Hive or Pig or Pregel or dot, dot, dot. So there are various other interfaces on top of MapReduce. But you get a three-level stack. Uh, at the bottom is the file system. Uh, in the middle is this MapReduce uh, API, and on top of that, various kinds of systems. Now, one of the biggest proponents of this stack is Facebook. And Facebook is willing to tell you, or they're willing to tell me, that they, in fact, have instrumented their traffic to this stack. And 96, 97% of it is coming in through Hive. 3%, 4% comes in through MapReduce. So this is an overwhelming SQL market. And everybody else seems to be pretty similar. That when you actually look at traffic, it's Hive. And and in case of Hive, you might, let's just, we'll call it SQL from now on, because unless you squint, it's SQL. So Hadoop is a SQL market. It, it's process. What did I do? Maybe the half hour is up, huh? <laughs> Hello? OK. So, so the Hadoop market is a SQL market, and we might as well just admit that that's true. Okay. So, okay. So let's look at the major proponents of, of Hadoop. So it's Cloudera and Hortonworks and Facebook. They're the people really pushing this. So all of them are writing new Hive executes, and Cloudera has just released theirs. It's called Impala. And Impala is not on top of MapReduce. It is a, an execution stack directly on top of, 
on top. It's a, an execution stack directly on top of HTTP. Yeah, forget it. Okay. So, so basically, 97% of the market, Cloudera's solution is an executor, a two-level stack executor on top of HDFS. Why did they do that? Well, they figured out what the database vendors have known forever, which is MapReduce is a crummy internal interface in the SQL system. No one in their right mind would design a SQL executor to go through MapReduce. It's just a dumb idea. None of the parallel database systems have anything like it. And Hadoop is quickly jettisoning the MapReduce layer. And so the stack that you guys are going to run is going to change dramatically. So meanwhile, what else is happening? Well, the parallel database vendors, people like Vertica. So Vertica supports Hive. If you like Hive, they're happy to translate Hive into their dialect of SQL. They're happy to run on HDFS. And they're happy to support semi-structured data. So the things that you guys like about the, the oh, that was my mistake. <laughs> are soon going to be indistinguishable from the data warehouse products. They're going to look exactly the same. And let's have a great Donnie Brook made the best product win. But when you think of a data lake as, as something different than a data warehouse, that's a bad way to look at things. Those, those two markets are going to converge. And what's happening right now is that all of the Hadoop vendors are encouraging you to put your data in a traditional Hadoop stack, the one that includes MapReduce. You're going to hit the wall because it's a performance disaster. And when you hit the wall, all of the all of the Hadoop vendors are going to say, "Well, switch to Impala. You know, it's going to it's going to uh, save your bacon." So basically, uh, I I have no problem with you. Uh, Trying out Hive on top of the, uh, you know, the open source new stack, just just know clearly it's going to be a performance disaster. You'll, you'll see the wall. Uh, you'll see the wall uh, coming at you, and when you hit the wall, and you will, the minute you put this in production, uh, then you can either switch to a warehouse system or in, in Palo or dot dot dot. You should think about what you want to do when you hit the wall up front so that it's not a surprise. So anyway, the, the, the Hadoop data lake is nothing but a data <laughs> warehouse market, and the two markets will converge. OK, let's talk about streaming data, since you guys are Wall Street folks. So. Uh, I actually know quite well a, a very, very large hedge fund that's in Chicago. I probably shouldn't use their name. Uh, so they do things like uh, look for patterns in a fire hose. So find me a strawberry followed within five milliseconds by a banana. And this is what is commonly called uh, complex event processing. Most of you guys are doing this not using commercial products. If you have homebrew mountains of code that is a maintenance nightmare. So anyway, this is, this is one thing you do on streaming data. Uh, the other thing you do on streaming data is that uh, this same hedge fund in Chicago uh, has electronic trading desks all over the world. 
and they want to assemble their real-time global position for or against every security they trade. And they want to ring the red, red telephone if there's too much risk. So basically, risk mitigation uh, they're very interested in. And this is assemble their global state and don't lose any messages. So this is a transactional application. The minute you lose messages, they're toast. And this is a sweet spot for, for main memory database systems. So systems like Volt are very good at this sort of application. So the CEP, so there's things that look like CEP and there's things that look like OLTP. And a reliable unnamed source, who I can't tell you who it is, uh, basically says there are a lot more OLTP problems than there are CEP problems. So the big market is, is OLTP. So if you're, if you're doing real-time processing, start thinking about this as a main memory transactional uh, problem. And of course, go look at Volt, because it's happy. What you do is you, you take in a message. That's parameters to a stored procedure. Uh, and Volt DB will process your stored procedures without ever losing anything, you know, in parallel with replication, all that stuff. And you can run queries if you want to find uh, if, if there's too much risk. You know, find me the enterprise position on IBM. And then lots of people want to run windowing queries, finding you know, Wall Street guys love moving averages of all sorts. VoltDB supports that stuff. So take a look at Volt. Uh, that's my one sales slide uh, in this whole deck. So streaming data of the OLTP sort works fine on Volt. Check it out. Okay, so Let's talk for just a millisecond about Flash. Uh, Flash is a disk substitute. Uh, no one thinks that people think of Flash as getting rid of uh, moving head disks and replacing them by solid state disks. And in a main memory world, this isn't that interesting. Uh, in a data warehouse world, it's interesting if you don't have a mountain of data, but most of you have a mountain of data. So it may or may not be interesting depending on whether you've got petabytes or not. But the thing that gets me excited is not Flash. It's what's going to come after Flash. And so the ironmongers are working on various stuff. It's not clear whether uh, phase change memory is going to succeed or memory skewers or dot, dot, dot. But everybody is convinced that there will be a non-volatile non -volatile RAM solution. The consensus of the ironmongers is that it will read at about a quarter the speed of DRAM. And it will write at about a tenth the speed of DRAM. And the thing that makes this really exciting is that this will be cheaper than Flash by around three years from now, four years from now. Uh, so a little birdie told me that, that this is what to expect and the time frame to expect it. Now, this may not happen. Uh, it's always wise to be skeptical of the, of the iron guys. But this may well replace Flash this decade. And the way it's going to happen is the flash guys, which is the camera market and the phone market, consumer electronics are going to shift to this stuff. It's going to drive the volumes up, and we all get the, the, to take advantage of cheap hardware from the consumer market. So this is likely to be really interesting because it will be dirt cheap and in the same general realm as main memory performance. So this is going to mean you can have a very big oil. Y'all should just keep keep watching how this unfolds. But I think there, there's, to me, this is the most interesting uh, technological thing on the horizon that we should pay attention to. OK, I have two more slides. So I want to talk about the elephant war, which uh, I'm delighted to watch from the sidelines. 
So yesterday or the Tuesday, Oracle announced a thing, a main memory option. Uh, what this is technically is it's a they're continuing to run their same legacy code path for reading and updating. So this is a replication. You can you can say that a table uh, is to be put in their main memory uh, option at which point you get a copy. And this is a, a main memory column store that's running in parallel. Everything is in, all data exists twice. If you update it, you update it twice. So uh, this is a HANA knockoff, you know, in, as a replica in Oracle. So this will make OLTP slower because every time I do an update, I gotta update two things. And it will mean that I have half as much main memory as I thought I had because I have two copies of everything. So they are completely focused on HANA. This is a HANA knockoff. Uh, so what's HANA up to? Well, SAP has been building this thing called HANA. It's a main memory column store. It's a OLAP system for now. They promise OLTP at some point in the future. They are going to rewrite 380 million lines of SAP R4 code to run on top of HANA. And their whole, their whole issue is that they are Oracle's biggest customer by far, and they don't want to be. And so, and so they, uh, there's no doubt in my mind that at some point in the future, all of a sudden, R4 is going to run a lot better on HANA than it runs on Oracle. And so they will try and take business away from, from Oracle uh, by changing their application. Meanwhile, Oracle is trying to, uh, is, is trying to uh, you know, make a, make a carbon copy of HANA to claim that they're competitive with HANA. So these guys are in each other's gun sites, and I'm delighted to watch from the sidelines, but it will be, in my opinion, very interesting to see these two legacy vendors uh, duking it out against each other. Uh, meanwhile, what's the other elephant up to? Uh, so Microsoft has recently released a system called Hecaton. Hecaton doesn't look at all like Oracle's offering. Hecaton is a perfectly reasonable new SQL main memory OLTP system. It looks sort of like Volt. It's running side by side with SQL Server. Any table is in one or the other. And one of these is the main memory database, and the other one is the standard traditional disk-based system. And you have to decide whether you want your data in Hecaton or in SQL Server. Now, the, the Microsoft engineers had in mind that this would be a separate offering. You know, stand, stand alone main memory database system to compete, compete against things like Volt. Uh, unfortunately, Microsoft marketing said, no, no, you can't do that. This has to all live under SQL Server 14. So underneath this very, very heavyweight uh, front-end ODBC system, you have this nimble main memory system, you know, basically burdened down by having to fit into this legacy universe. So uh, SQL Server 14 has a data log, so you have to pay the overhead of Aries, which VoltDB, of course, doesn't pay. Uh, we have an active-active replication system, which is much faster than you doing active-passive, which they're stuck with because that's from the, the SQL Server environment. So uh, Hecaton is, is a pretty reasonable main memory data, OLTP database system with one, one foot and both hands nailed to the floor by having to fit into uh, SQL Server 14. So in my opinion, the elephants are starting to, you know, sort of uh, both move toward main memory and move and, and sort of start duking it out with each other. Uh, none of this stuff is going to run very well because it's all fitting into this legacy code uh, system from 30 years ago. 
So I'm delighted they're getting lots of lots of PR. If you want to go fast, um, check out Volt, uh, check out Vertica, uh, and if you want to go slow, uh, then check out these guys. So that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>